couple of weeks, the book of Acts, and then a uh, special service on the 23rd. And really, to jump right into it, there isn't a ton of review, but you know the story about how they ship, they got shipwrecked, right? I mean, they went through so much. They sailed to Fair Havens, then they tried to go to Phoenix. They, they got lost for two weeks out in the middle of the Mediterranean. They finally ended up on the island of Malta, and that's kind of what we're picking up today in the very first couple of verses of Acts chapter 28. In fact, this is basically where we left off. It's interesting. I started. I got halfway through my message this morning typing it out, and I made one false click, and it was gone. <laughs> I was like, oh God, I was, I was trying to save it, and I clicked on another file that was already saved, and it was just history. There was no more. So I went back through real quick and made it up, but actually, I think it came out a little better. <laughs> so maybe it needed to happen that way. Um, but so we left off last week in Acts chapter 28, the very first verse, which basically says, they say, uh, once safely ashore, we found out that we that the island was called Malta. So they were on the island of Malta, and that's where they ended up. We ended up kind of leaving off. So they finally arrived safely, and you, you, I want you to put yourself in, in their position again as we go back into this storyline. You know, they've been at sea for all this time. Paul tried to warn them when they left Fair Havens that it was already way too late in the season to start sailing. He tried to warn them they didn't listen. And then right before they ended up on the island, he told them that he was visited by an angel at the latter part of Acts chapter 27 and that everybody was going to make it safely, but that they would lose the ship. And so at this point, they're on the island Everything that Paul has said has pretty much come to pass the way that Paul has said it. And so I've wondered at this point what the, what the crew must think of Paul and what they've seen and what they've witnessed. It's interesting, um, there's, a, there's a song that's out right now. And it's called, I've Witnessed It. I don't know, anybody heard that song that's out on the radio right now? Okay, do me a favor, pull out your phone. I'm not going to sing it. Pull out your phone and Google it right now. It's called, I've Witnessed It. And listen to it, not now, but when you leave service today, listen to this song. It's a great song. And it's a song over the last week that Melanie and I have listened to many, many times in the car, so much so that I've woken up every day of this last week with that song stuck in my head. I don't know if you're like me, but sometimes you wake up with songs stuck in your head. But there is just this one little part in the song that I want to quote. I'm not going to sing, but I want to quote to you. And it says, and I'm confident I will see it again and again. And the, basically the song is about all that God's done and how, we've, how, they've, how you've been able to witness it and how you're confident that you'll see it again and again. It's interesting because October will mark the 15-year mark that Melanie and I have been pastoring this church. And I was just thinking this week, this year marks the 26-year mark of me personally after i've given my life to the lord 26 years of following the lord and let me tell you something after 26 years you've seen a lot all right i'm sure that somebody with longer time than that can probably attest to more but one of the things i know is is that i've seen a lot and so knowing this is one point that i want to make knowing what god has said in scripture and seeing his will come to pass can and should produce confidence in the future. And I'm sorry, but I don't have a cheat sheet back there today, so I will turn to these screens over here. But let me say that again. Knowing what God has said in his scripture and seeing his will come to pass can and should produce 
a sense of confidence in us and what God is going to do in the future. So let's continue this story because I, I just wanted to put ourselves in the crew. Because imagine you've been in this crew, you've been at sale for two weeks, all this stuff has happened. Paul's warned you, Paul said this was going to happen. Everything that Paul has said has happened to a T up to this point. And here you are, you're either a crew member on the ship or you're either a prisoner on the ship and you've witnessed everything that Paul has said and you've witnessed what he has said has come to pass because he has basically restated what God has told him. So let's look at what kind of takes place after this. So verse 2, the islanders show up. Uh, the islanders showed us unusual kindness. They built a fire. So again, they just arrived on the beach of this, this island. And I don't even know how they knew it was Malta at that point. But maybe that's something that Luke put into this story after the fact. At this point, they probably didn't even know where they were. But these, these islanders show up and they start showing this shipwreck of, what was the number, 287? I, can't, I think it was, something like that. It was close to that. There's, there's almost 300 people on this beach, and these islanders show up and start showing them this unusual kindness. They built a fire, and they welcomed us all because it was raining and cold. Paul gathered a pile of brushwood, and as he put it on the fire, a viper driven out by the heat fastened itself on his hand. I don't know much about vipers, but I know they're deadly, and I never want to get bit by one. And if you'll see the story progress right here, the islanders knew they were deadly too. So look at what takes place. Verse 4, when the islanders saw the snake hanging from his hand, can you picture this? Like the snake bites his hand, and it's just sitting there hanging. So it's not like he just grabbed it and ripped it off. It's just sitting there hanging from Paul's hand. All the venom and everything is flowing into his bloodstream at this point. They said to each other, This man must be a murderer. For though he escaped the sea, the goddess justice has not allowed him to live. So they came to this conclusion. They basically thought, well, they don't know anything about this guy who just showed up on his beach. But they know that somehow or another he escaped the sea. And here he is getting bit by a viper. This must be, listen to this, this, this must be a form of judgment and a form of justice on this man. Now here's the thing is that they made a mistake that you and I often make, okay? We will see one event happen to somebody and make a judgment without zero context. Have you ever done that before? I'm guilty of that. I've seen something happen in somebody's life before, and immediately I will think there must be this reason behind it because they must have done A, B, or C. And that's exactly what these islanders thought. And so we may see someone struggling and say to ourselves, they must have done something to deserve that, which is exactly what the conclusion that the islanders came to. However, I think the correct approach should be to refrain from judgment and try to understand why. It's the approach that the Lord wants us to take because here's the deal. There may be a reason bad things are happening, but knowing the context will allow us to help if help is wanted. And so context is important. You can't just see something happen to somebody and say that, well, there, there's got to be a reason for that and they must have done A, B, and C, and this is why that happened. This is the conclusion that these islanders came to. In fact, I can't remember the location. You might even help me with this by Googling it, but Jesus talked about this one time when a tower fell on people in the Gospels. And Jesus basically said, well, 
when this tower fell on people, was it their fault that the tower fell on them? Or were they just caught up in this? And so even Jesus kind of spoke to this idea of, of how we like to kind of justify things without even knowing context in times. And so now, the interesting thing is, is this pendulum will swing crazy the other way. So they automatically judge him as a bad person, but watch what happens next. Look at verse, uh, verse 5. But Paul shook the snake off and suffered no ill effects. Didn't rip it off. You know, didn't have somebody help pry it off. She shook it off. Kind of like Jesus told us to shake off the sand off our, off our sandals. Just, just shook it off and suffered no ill effects. The people expected him to swell up or suddenly fall dead. But after waiting a long time and seeing nothing unusual happen to him, <laughs> they changed their minds and said he was a god. So how interesting is this? They go from saying that he's a murderer to he's a god. And by the way, the same principle applies. All right? Just because one good thing happens to a person doesn't automatically mean that they have some divine connection. All right? We like to see things that happen to other people and kind of judge it against what happens to us. But the truth is, is that you and I are all walking our own personal walks and our own relationships with the Lord. And what happens in my life is not going to necessarily be reflected about what happens in your life. And so these people made a judgment, but then it swung hard the other way where they basically called him a god because nothing happened. And the truth is, is that, you know what? God was with him, but he wasn't a god. In fact, um, I caught myself the other day because a lot of times we can attribute things to this. We were standing at the door moving back in to the church, and they were backing the trailer up as we were bringing the stuff in, and Donna over here was playing AC Gatekeeper. So, so basically, nobody really assigned her this role, but that's the way Donna operates. You don't have to assign her anything. She just takes, she takes on the responsibility and does what needs to be done. And so she was literally standing at the door, making sure nobody didn't open the door until the trailer had backed up because she was trapping the air condition into the building. And there was no reason the doors needed to be open if the trailer wasn't there. And so the trailer backs up and the doors swing open from permission from Donna. And uh, <laughs> so we, we begin to, to put the, the cones, to, we begin to put the cones there at the door to prop the doors open. And I'm over there and I'm swinging some of the cones up against the doors. And she was saying that, you, you know, these won't stay. These, these cones won't stay. And so I just happened to manipulate the cones in a way where they stayed. And, they, and she goes, huh, look at that. They stayed for you, or something to that nature. And I had to catch myself because I automatically wanted to say, that's the favor of the Lord, you know? <laughs> in fact, I thought that in my head as just a smart remark. It wasn't anything that I was, you know, coming across like, I'm, you know, look at me, I'm the pastor, anything like that. It was just the first pop that, the thought that popped in my head is, yeah, look at the favor, you know, the Lord or whatever. I stopped myself from saying it. I never said that. I think I just said, yeah, I got lucky or something, you know. But oftentimes, you know, that's some things that we might attribute things to. And the truth is, is that the favor of the Lord is real, okay? Because all you have to do is read the story of Joseph to figure that out. You ever read the story of Joseph? Sold into slavery, became second in command in Potiphar's home, eventually became second in command over Egypt. And the whole theme throughout the entire story 
is, is that God was with him and gave him favor. All right? But attributing favor to cones is ridiculous. And so oftentimes, you know, the, 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 the favor of the Lord is real, but favor is mostly tied to obedience. And so if you look at that story, you'll see that because Joseph was obedient and followed the Lord, he had to favor the Lord. And so any parent understands this. I mean, you, you ever had a child acting up and then turn around and ask for something? While they're acting up and doing something and then, then they want a favor from you? What is your reply? Yeah, not now. You're not getting it now. Why don't you act up, act right, act proper, and then you can maybe go and do this or whatever. I mean, any parent understands this, this principle, but um, this is why I go back to that point that context matters. is because I'm sure that all the people, think of this, the islanders never witnessed these people before. There's almost 300 people that came off of this boat and are on that beach that have, been, that have spent the last two weeks with Paul. And what do you think their explanation for why Paul didn't suffer any ill effects from the snake was? It was because Paul knew the, knew the Lord. It wasn't because Paul was a god like the islanders thought. It was because Paul followed God and they knew that. So that's why context matters. So instead of just making an assumption of something, context is important for why things happen. And all those people that were on that boat understood why Paul didn't suffer any ill effects. Because they knew the Lord was with him. So let's continue on. Verse 7. There was an estate nearby that belonged to Publius. The chief official of the island. Now, this is the guy that's over the island. He's the kind of the governor of the island, if you will. He welcomed us to, this, to his home and showed us generous hospitality for three days. His father was sick in bed and suffering from fever and dysentery. Paul went in to see him and after prayer placed his hands on him and healed him. When this happened... The rest of the sick on the island came and were cured. So imagine if they've already thought that he was a god, what they might think after this. Paul has this introduction of this guy's father. But one of the things you've got to understand, too, is Luke's with Paul, who's a physician as well. And so I like, I think that this is something that we discount. I, I like how... Paul is praying over people and heals people supernaturally, but yet all these other sick people show up, and oftentimes we forget that there's a physician with Paul at the same time, Luke. And so I think it's very important to point out that oftentimes God will work in conjunction with faith and science to heal us. It, it may be one or the other sometimes, but oftentimes they work in conjunction together. But so all these other people that are sick on the island begin to show up in droves, and Paul begins to pray over them, and they get healed as well. Now, I don't know if you know what dysentery is, but I had to Google it this morning. It's basically an intestines infection, and the common symptoms are stomach pains, um, diarrhea, blood in your diarrhea, and also fever. And so this guy, this, the father of this, of this uh, chief official was suffering from this on the, on the island. And after prayer was healed from this. And so I think, I don't know how severe dysentery is. But I think I might have had an encounter with this when we were on vacation two years ago. Because I think something hit me. And didn't let go for like a whole week. All I know is that everywhere we went, I had to locate the restrooms first. 
and I'm not kidding. I mean, it was a great vacation, but something hit me on that vacation, and every restaurant, every public place, it was okay, where's the restrooms at? Uh, but So anyway, maybe I got hit with this, I don't know, but, but I'm sure it's not pleasant. I think we can all come to that conclusion. So let's go on. Verse 10. They honored us in many ways, and when we were ready to sail, they furnished us with, with the supplies we needed. After three months, so I think this is interesting, because oftentimes, and I say this time and time again, when you read through Scripture, you don't get timelines very good. And so the fact that there's a timeline here is, is important. Because we've already discussed that Paul didn't want to sail from Fair Havens because it is already past the Day of Atonement. So winter had came, and winter was coming to an end, or at least coming to a close by the time that they had been given these supplies. And you'll see they've been given another ship. So the timeline's kind of important. So look at verse 11. After three months, we put out to sea in a ship that had wintered in the island. It was an Alexandrian ship. By the way, the last ship they were on was an Alexandrian ship too. It was an Alexandrian ship with the figurehead of the twin gods, Castor and Pollux. Now, these twin gods are Greek mythology. They're said to be uh, two twin de deities. Uh, that, that was One of them was from uh, the son of uh, Jupiter or, or Zeus and I don't think that the I don't think that the family lineage is important to us because it doesn't pertain to our faith. However, what's important to the story is, is that these two twin supposedly deities were known to give fair weather in sailing. And so the fact that these twin heads were on the top of the on the front of the ship, in fact, oftentimes there would be a sacrifice of some sort made to Castor and Pollux before sailing for fair weather as a prayer that was kind of issued for fair weather and sailing and so there's a reason that these two mythology characters were on the head of the ship because it was believed that there would be good sailing um, because of them so just a little kind of filling in the gaps there verse 12 we put in at Syracuse and sailed there three days from there we set sail and arrived in regimen the next day the south wind came up which is what you need from where they're located to go to rome you need that good south wind south wind came up and on the following day we reach petulii now these are all locations i don't have a map today but they're making their way to rome and so far Everything has worked out perfectly. There we found some brothers and sisters who invited us to spend a week with them. And so we came to Rome. But by the way, it's, it's about time. Oh, look at that. Was that a past map that we had already? Yeah. Josh is prepared. So look, you can, so you can see from where they landed on Malta and they came up and sailed to Rome. There we go. I meant to do that with a little help. But let's read on, okay? Verse 15. The brothers and sisters there had heard that we were coming, and they, tra and they traveled as far as Forum of Aphius and the three taverns to meet us. Now you might ask yourself, wait a minute. There's brothers and sisters in Rome already? Well, yeah, because this actually takes us all the way back to the beginning of this book. At the day of Pentecost, when everybody from all over the known world joined in in Jerusalem for that celebration where the Holy Spirit fell, and then they all went back to their known cities. And obviously, here we are at the conclusion of, of this book, and we learn that there are brothers and sisters in Rome from what happened in Acts chapter 2. So they met them, and they, they had already traveled from, uh, from 
distant lands to be there. Um, at the sight of these people, Paul thanked God and was encouraged. It's encouraging when you show up to a location and you have people that you know, right? You ever been somewhere and you're like, yeah, I'm like, we're like a sore thumb sticking out of this place. And you show up and you're like, hey, we know you, hey, brothers and sisters, you know. So Paul's experiencing the encouragement of what it feels like to know somebody in a strange place because Paul has never been to Rome. But his intention was to get there. And so we'll conclude with chapter, or verse 16 today. And this is where we'll, we'll finish it off. When we got to Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with a soldier to guard him. So Paul was given some freedom. He wasn't thrown yet into a jail cell. He wasn't thrown into a dungeon or nothing like that. He was actually able to live in a place by himself. However, he did have a Roman guard that was with him that kept an eye on him. And I think this is interesting because Julius, the guy that was with him from the beginning of this expedition on this boat, kind of knew Paul and gave him a lot of freedom. And now here we are in Rome and Paul still has the favor of the Lord with him and has been granted this freedom to be able to live on his own with a guard. And then we'll conclude next week with the very last section of chapter 28 but I want to throw a thought inside your head and I'm going to ask you to stand as we close. So, my thought, that, and that's something I want you to just ponder for a little bit. Why? Why the delay? Why the delay? They set sail off for of Rome. They arrive in Rome. At this point now, it's been over three weeks. Actually, it's been, sorry, it said it was three months in the Scripture. I think it's safe to assume that at least somewhere between four to six months has gone by four to six months from the timeline that we have given to us in Scripture has gone by from the moment that they set sail, they left Caesarea, to the time that they arrived in Rome. And the question to you is, why the delay? And the truth is, and the point is, is that we're never given that reason. We will conclude the book of Acts, and we will never be told why they were delayed that entire trip. Now, we can reason some things, walk through me together with some of these reasons. Maybe there were people on the ship. Maybe there was a crew on the ship that was going to Rome. And for whatever reason, God allowed all that to happen so that every prisoner, so that every crewmate, so that everybody that was aboard that ship could witness the hand of God in what happened. Is that a good reason? Maybe. But we're never told that. Okay, so let's, let's, let's maybe, let's, another reason. Maybe Paul is about to experience some really crazy something that's about to take place in Rome. By the way, a couple years go by and Paul is beheaded at the hands of Nero. Caesar Nero. And maybe Paul is about to, f to face this life or death situation and he needs one last reminder from the Lord that I will always be with you and whatever happens to you, I will be with you. Maybe that's the reason. We can go on and on and on, but let me just give you one more. Maybe there was a group of people on the island of Malta 
Maybe there was a bunch of foreigners and islanders on this island. And maybe God had them go all off track so that they would just land on this island so that the Word of God can be taught to this entire group of people that would have may have never heard at least in that area of time God's Word be preached. The interesting thing is, is that we never learn why. All we know is, is that they were blown off course and it took them four to six months to arrive in Rome. Now here's the interesting thing. Is, is that there are seasons throughout your life and there are seasons throughout my life that will continue to change. In fact, in, Ephes uh, in Ecclesiastes, the Word of God says there's a season for everything. And you may be in a season right now where you're questioning, why is this happening? What's going on? On the swing side of it, because this is what I've witnessed, I've witnessed times of questioning. I've also witnessed times of growth. Times where you, you're in these seasons that require you to dig deep to figure out what's going to happen next. And on the other hand, there are incredible seasons of blessings that we may experience where it just seems like that there's a different form of growth where it's not necessarily that you're having to dig deep to figure out what's taking place, but you're just kind of sitting back going, I don't know how all this is happening, but it seems like there's just all these things that seem to be falling into place and I'm just going to ride the wave for a little bit and enjoy this. The truth is, is there are seasons in everything. And I don't know what season you're in right now, but I will tell you, the one thing that I know is that if you believe in the Lord and you trust in Him and you do what Paul did in this scenario, through all the winds, through all the turmoil and everything, and you follow God's will however hard that might be in fact i don't know if you can show this again if you can throw up that prayer slide josh you probably don't have it ready but during the prayer section we have remember earlier how i talked about confidence how when you witness something over and over again you have a sense of confidence this is the confidence we have in approaching god that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And the key point of this is, what's God's will? And this is the thing that you and I will be challenged with in every season of our life. The good, the bad, the ugly. What is God's will in this scenario what is his will for me in this season and that's something that you're going to have to wrestle with through prayer seeking the lord maybe even asking people that you know have wisdom for guidance but i do know one thing I'm not going to promise you that everything is going to work out the way that you think it is. I will promise you, though, if you seek the Lord's will, that He'll work it out for your good. Because it is His promise that He loves us and works on our behalf for the good of those that love Him that are called according to His purpose. And that's a reminder to each and every one of us. So we don't know why. We're never given the answer why this entire ship was delayed four to six months. 
And sometimes you and I can be delayed in our own personal walk, and sometimes we go through different seasons. But it's imperative that whatever season that you're in, that you're seeking after the Lord's will for that season. Let's pray as we close. Father, we want to be people that desire what you desire. We don't want to make up our own minds. We don't want to be so stubborn that we get set in our own ways. And we surely don't want to be delayed from something that we're doing. If there is a delay, we pray that Your will be done through that. In Ephesians, in Ecclesiastes, Lord, Your Scripture reminds us that there's a season for everything. And I pray, Father, that no matter what season every individual might be in, that they would go back and evaluate where they're at and they would pray and seek You for Your will. And that Your will will be done in their lives. And when we do that, Father, we know that Your promise is true. That You work for the good that love You. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's give God a hand clap, church, for He's good. All right, just, oh, offering? I didn't do an offering. <laughs> so we'll bring the buckets up here, guys. Let me bless the offering, and I'll dismiss you. Uh, we, got, we got them up there already. Good deal. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time of giving, and uh, we thank you for everything that we have. We've got so much, Father, and we pray that you would allow us um, as individuals to really just do inventory, take, take a good look at what we have, and... Uh, figure out how to honor you the best way possible through that. Uh, it is our heart's desire that we acknowledge that everything we have is yours anyway. And so with a portion of it, we respect you and honor you by giving it back. And when we do that, I pray, Father, that your blessing be on that gift. In Jesus' name, amen. Ladies and gentlemen, you are dismissed. God bless you. Have a great week.